In the last two centuries, American farmers have created the most efficient, productive, and sustainable food production system the world has ever seen. American farmers also face a complicated web of legal, regulatory, and political pressures unlike anything their forebears would recognize. Michael Beston Friedrich is a full-service law firm with more than 350 lawyers and technical professionals. The firm's agribusiness team has worked with farmers and related groups for decades. In addition, our lawyers grew up on farms and have experience working in various parts of the food chain. To learn more about Michael Best, please visit michaelbest.com. Good morning. I'd like to again welcome everyone to the virtual Dairy Strong Conference. And thank you again for choosing our session. A special thank you goes out to Michael Best, whose video you just watched, for sponsoring our session. My name is Maria Walt, and I'll be moderating today's session. I serve as the program manager for the Dairy Innovation Hub. If you have questions, we'll take them at the end, but you can type them into the question section uh, located in your uh, conference platform. Anything that we don't get to during the actual session, we'll make a point to um, follow up with you after the event. So today, you're gonna learn a little bit about three research projects that are currently underway that focus on both environmental as well as economic sustainability. But before we dive into their projects, I'd like to, I'd like to offer a short grounding um, on the Dairy Innovation Hub itself and how we got started. The Hub is now well into its second year and is already having impacts across the three participating campuses. Of the uh, 7.8 million in annual funding, which was 8.8 million for the, this current biennial state budget. 52% of that money goes to UW-Madison and 24% each to uh, UW-Platteville and UW-River Falls. And those funds are used to build research capacity, recruit top talent, um, engage in outreach like we're doing today, and support innovative pro uh, projects. And um, the hub encompasses all aspects of dairy, um, as you will see represented in our graphic here um, uh, on the right-hand side of the screen. In addition to supporting existing dairy researchers, um, as you're gonna see today, the hub is really um, generating interest from faculty and staff who are really new to dairy, who maybe don't have a background in dairy. And um, that really represents a new opportunity for collaboration, fresh ideas and perspectives, and, and we, you know, we view that as a good thing. The Dairy Business Association, along with several other key champions, really helped make the hub a reality. So I wanna go over just real quickly, how did we get to where we're at today? The concept um, was endorsed first uh, in December of 2018 by the Dairy Task Force 2.0 and was followed by introduction of legislation um, by Senator Markline and Representative Trannel in May of 2019. The following months included uh, approval of a spending plan and you know, developing mechanisms at each campus to uh, review proposals and um, and make funding decisions. So um, December 2019, so just over a year ago, um, the funds, first funds were released to each campuses, um, or to each campus, I should say, and, um, you know, then kind of the ball just continued to roll from there. And, um, you know, despite campuses being closed due to COVID-19, um, fortunately, we have met all of our benchmarks and goals for the first fiscal year um, as reported in our first annual report, which came out um, just a few months ago in October. 
Um, this winter and spring, um, the hub is really going to be focused on recruiting talent. So at each at each campus, um, you know, between the three campuses, we're going to be recruiting eight hub funded faculty members. Um, and then we're going to continue to do the things that we've done um, over the past year, like fund equipment, um, research projects, graduate students, etc. <clears throat> An aspect of the hub that we really can't overemphasize is the collaboration between each campus. Now this graphic is a little bit small depending on uh, what screen you're using, but um, we've, in, we've really encouraged collaboration not only across the leadership teams, so the deans of those three universities, but really across faculty and staff as well. And, um, you know, DBA has two spots on our Hub Advisory Council. So to the, um, that would be your right of this slide, you'll see that Advisory Council graphic. Um, DBA, as well as a couple other stakeholders, have spots on that Advisory Council. And um, DBA's two spots are filled uh, by, uh, right now, by far uh, a farmer, uh, Mitch Breinig. And Mitch also serves as the Council Chairperson um, for the whole hub. That second spot is filled by Eric Dieter from Landmark Services Cooperative. And um, Mitch and Eric, along with the whole council, they really work hard to ensure that the hub is living up to its promises and you know staying true to the goals that um, were developed you know, a couple years ago as part of that uh, dairy task force that I mentioned. Now that you know a little bit about the Hub, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Susie Weisner from the Department of Biological Systems Engineering at UW-Madison. Welcome to Susie. Thanks, Maria. And thank you all for having me here. And really thanks to Maria for organizing this session for us and uh, for leading this um, discussion. So I will now tell you a little bit about my project that was funded by the Dairy Innovation Hub. Uh, I'm studying environmental and economic sustainability of different cropping systems and management strategies in dairy systems. And this project is really a collaboration uh, between the University of Wisconsin and the U.S. Dairy Forage Research Center. Um, next slide, please. Um, so as we all know, um, CO2 emissions are steadily increasing with the exception actually of last year where COVID lockdowns slowed down emissions by 7% compared to 2019. Um, greater atmospheric CO2 emissions lead to global climate change, which uh, includes continuous increases in average temperatures across the globe. But most importantly, climate change causes more frequent and more severe extreme events, which can be devastating for agricultural systems. So for example, in Wisconsin, um, we are experiencing really great fluctuations in annual rainfall, ranging from droughts to uh, extreme precipitation events. So in 2019, average uh, annual rainfall went up to 1200 millimeters per year. So that was an increase of approximately 30% over the long-term average um, that Wisconsin usually received. And that really led to floods, unpredictable, unpredictable management str uh, strategies and schedules and crop losses. Um, agriculture contributes approximately 10% of US greenhouse gas emissions and 15% globally, where livestock agriculture is really the main contributor with about 65%. And the majority of that stems from enteric fermentation of livestock. However, that's really just part of the story because agricultural systems also cover approximately 50% of the global habitable land surface. So that's a vast amount of vegetation cover that offers an opportunity to mitigate um, greenhouse gas emissions by taking up atmospheric CO2 and by storing it in above ground and below ground biomass, especially when the vegetation cover is continuous in the case of um, perennial vegetation. But greenhouse gas emissions are also just part of the problem as conventional uh, annual agriculture has led to large soil carbon losses, um, specifically when the management included tillage. And this is important not just because we need to store carbon in the soil to mitigate climate change, but also because soil with little organic matter is less productive and more prone to pathogens and soil erosion and requires more inputs like fertilizer. 
Um, there was a study that was published just last year that found that U.S. agriculture spends about half a billion U.S. dollars every year to replace, only replace nutrients um, with fertilizer that have been lost due to soil erosions. So if we were to shift at least parts of agricultural vegetation to sustainable practices like perennials, this could really help restore soil functions and store more uh, soil carbon. The question though is um, how much of a farm footprint can be converted to maximize outcomes and uh, why sustaining farm production um, in the case of dairy milk production and how long does it take to improve soil functions. So with my project I want to understand how agricultural vegetation can help mitigate greenhouse gas emissions and more importantly help um, improve soil quality and how these ecosystem services can be used to provide more income for producers. Um, the credits could include carbon credits, but also evapotranspiration or infiltration credits in the case of Wisconsin. And this could really help reduce dairy farm bankruptcies by offering greater flexibility for farmers, apart from only milk markets. Um, so this work is done at the U.S. Dairy Forge Research Center farm in Prairie du Sac, Wisconsin. So this is a working research dairy farm on 890 hectares of land. The herd includes approximately 350 milking cows uh, as of now and 300 heifers and dry cows. And each cow produces on average 80 pounds of milk per day. So the farm grows alfalfa, corn and soybeans, winter wheat, and has recently started to um, also include cover crops. And additionally, a large proportion of the farm is perennial vegetation of shrubs, grasslands, forests and pastures. Um, annual average temperatures for Sauk County are about 48.4 Fahrenheit and uh, rainfall is about 880 millimeters per year. But again, um, as I said, this number really fluctuates um, due to climate change. So the farm has two eddy covariance towers that measure carbon, water, energy, and methane fluxes, as well as meteorological variables like temperature and rainfall. So in the picture or in the figure on the right, you can see um, where those towers are located, indicated by those um, orange and red stars. And on the left is a schematic on the bottom. Um, that's, that's how an eddy covariance tower looks like. So we have a tall tower that is 100 feet tall, and this one measures fluxes from several different cropping systems. So that's the red star. And we have a smaller tower that is 10 feet tall, and this one is located within an intermediate wheatgrass field that is experimentally grown for grain, which is called Kernza, and foraged in collaboration with the Land Institute in Kansas. So to understand vegetation productivity, carbon sequestration, and water and energy dynamics in this system, I use eddy covariance techniques. Um, and then uh, in conjunction with remote sensing techniques from satellites. And then now we also obtained a drone. So I'll be using drone multispectral images as well. And in addition to that, we also have um, ground measurements, which include biomass, soil sampling, and so forth. So one objective of this project is really to improve greenhouse gas budgets for dairy farms and other agricultural systems, because traditionally farm carbon footprints only include emissions uh, per pounds of milk produced, where emissions usually um, originate from management, enteric fermentation, electricity, as well as imports of feed and fertilizer. So you can see one on the left here. However, this really ignores the role, role farm vegetation uh, plays in mitigating some or even all of those emissions by taking up CO2 from the atmosphere. We recently published a paper um, in the Journal of Sustainability that showed that the Dairy Forage Research Center farm was able to mitigate all greenhouse gas emissions that originated from the farm. Now, of course, this farm is relatively large and we have a lot of um, perennial vegetation. So, um, however, measuring every single flux is time consuming and expensive. expensive. So I use remote sensing products to um, help simplify this process so that we can apply this not just on this farm, but on other farms as well. So this information could really help producers increase their profits through these credits that I mentioned, but also may attract um, more consumers that are looking to buy um, net zero uh, grown products. So um, here are some of the results we obtained using remote sensing data and eddy covariance techniques to estimate ve uh, vegetation productivity of the farm uh, at the dairy, uh, U.S. Dairy Forage Research Center. 
On the left, you see two figures. The top one is from 2019. The bottom one is from 2018. Um, both show you the relationship between estimated productivity and uh, grams of carbon on the x-axis, which uh, is basically all the carbon that was taken up by the vegetation to produce biomass. And then on the y-axis, we have field net primary productivity that are estimated from harvest data uh, using harvest indices, root to shoot ratios, as well as carbon contents of the uh, crops. So each point here represents one um, field at the farm and the different colors are different crops like alfalfa, corn, soybeans and wheat. So you can see that we were able to model the farm harvest uh, very well with average errors of only 15%. So that's pretty good. Um, other products that this techniques uh, offer um, are uh, bi biomass maps that you can see in the center here which really would allow farm managers to assess the landscape quality as well as potential problems um, uh, of productivity on their farm as these would show up really well. So this year I will use drone technologies to improve um, the resolution of these maps even more. So this data can now be used to obtain carbon accumulation rates specifically for perennial vegetation and crops that stay within the farm boundaries. So on the right there, on the top, you see a table where I estimated some hypothetical income from carbon credits that could potentially be collected by farmers from perennial vegetation. So here I'm just showing you um, forest shrubs, pastures and grasslands for our farm. So I took the $15 per metric ton estimate that Indigo Ag advertises for um, their carbon credit payments. Now, of course, these dollar amounts actually relate to soil carbon sequestration, but in my opinion, because continuous vegetation continues to take up atmospheric CO2, there's potential to include credits for um, carbon that is stored in perennial vegetation as well. So you can see that our forests and grasslands on the farm really take up the highest amounts of carbon, which is not surprising as these systems have little or no management. And then finally, on the bottom right picture, we have an annual carbon budget for our farm. This was for 2018. And this is an area we would like to improve as many of these estimates, estimates really stem from IPCC equations, which are mainly based on uh, cow head counts and feed intakes. Um, we already found that enteric fermentation estimates underestimated methane and overestimated CO2 emissions by 20% for our farm when we compared these two chamber measurements that were performed with live animals at the farm. So this is really an area we would like to get um, more accurate estimates for. And then now these are the small scale plots um, from the Dairy Innovation Hub project. Um, these were established in May 2020 of last year and here we um, aim to quantify ecological and economic benefits from shifting um, cropping systems from mainly conventional annual agriculture like corn over cover crops, intercropping to perennials in monoculture and polyculture like pastures. Um, these plots are 30 by 30 feet and are repeated four times in four blocks. Um, so there's a picture on the left you can see. We have six different cropping treatments as well as three different manure treatments, which include no manure, spring manure, and uh, fall manure applications. Um, this past year, we planted corn across all plots to obtain baseline measurements. And then in September 20 plan uh, 2020, we planted the perennial plots. In, uh, and then the spring, we will plant the rest of the plots, um, which includes the corn plots. And uh, these plots serve to investigate changes in soil and forage quality based on cropping systems and manure applications. For that purpose, we are measuring soil nutrients, soil respiration, forage quality, soil texture and compaction, and uh, many other soil parameters like soil moisture and infiltration. Um, there's a whole bunch of measurements we're doing. And these measurements will help us understand what cropping systems offer the greatest rate of soil improvements, the highest forage quality for milk production or uh, the greatest carbon sink potential. And then following that, um, with that data, we're, we will determine economic trade-offs um, through milk production and income from ecosystem service credits. And then um, this uh, are some preliminary results. Um, they look a little, little bit overwhelming and um, there's no clear message here yet because these are preliminary data. We collected last season, which includes organic matter on the left, P and K in the center, pH to the uh, second of the, from the right and month, monthly soil respiration on the right from the month of July. 
I put these here because I wanted to show you how spatially variable all these parameters are, even at this small scale. So this is really important to consider as carbon markets develop techniques to measure soil carbon sequestration across different regions or farms, so that the liability does not end up negatively affecting farm income. So this project will address the capacity to decrease this uncertainty in measurement and models to establish successful market opportunities for ecosystem services. And with that, I'd really like to thank, again, the Dairy Innovation Hub for funding my project. I'm really excited to work uh, on this. Um, I also want to acknowledge some other funding sources that I had throughout my postdoc, um, which included the Oak Ridge Institute for Science and Education, the Land Institute, and Patagonia Provisions. And then I'd really like to thank all my collaborators, um, but especially my colleagues at the U.S. Dairy Forage Research Center, Alison Duff and Chris Neiman, and my postdoc advisors, Paul Stoy and Ankara Desai. And thank you all so much for watching. And then uh, I'd like to turn it over to Matt Dickman. Thanks, Susie. Um, so I'm Matthew Digman. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and uh, it had occurred to me during Maria's presentation that I kind of took a tour of the hub before I came to this position. I grew up near Platteville, Wisconsin, on a dairy farm, and uh, I was an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin River Falls. And a project that I worked on there with my undergraduate researchers um, became the beginning of this project that we've started here at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Um, I would like to thank my co-authors, uh, Dr. Larson, she's our manure expert. Um, Dr. Sanford and Feng um, are both postdocs that were supported by the Dairy Innovation Hub. And you might be thinking, why did we get two postdocs? Well, <laughs> um, Dr. Sanford was hired by the University of Wisconsin Platteville uh, through a Dairy Hub appointment. Um, so we have already have one success from this project is uh, securing Dr. Sanford for the University of Wisconsin. Next slide. So <clears throat> really, um, and also ties into um, what Susie was talking about, is we're really looking at nutrient utilization and cycling on the farm. And um, you know, as engineers, we always think about things as far as where nutrients are moving, what is their value, where are they being lost, how are we recapturing them? And we think spectral uh, sensors in particular um, can be utilized um, to give producers this information. It started out um, on the crop side um, with the forage harvester. And um, also that's where I've been sticking with the same thing for a long time. I worked on the NIR sensor with John Deere on the forage harvester um, for my master's degree. And um, that led to the collaboration at River Falls where we wanted to uh, look at the efficacy of this technology in manure. And you know, a company like John Deere and others who are competing in this space are really looking at opportunities to provide value to their customers. I can tell you for, for certain that I've pitched a lot of ideas to them over the years that they didn't want to fund. <laughs> and, and you know, there's a story here about managing nutrients, nutrient utilization on dairy farms if, um, if companies like Deere are making investments. Um, next slide. So from the Dairy Innovation Hub um, perspective and from our stakeholders in Wisconsin, we really want to take a look at it not as engineers who are trying to, to build an enabling technology, but as users and adopters of this technology. So I had to switch hats, right? I had to take the hat off of, let's do everything we can to make this work to really understand where it works, when is it profitable, and when is it valuable um, to our stakeholders. Next slide. So what is near-infrared reflectance spectroscopy? Well, it does tie into uh, what Susie was talking about. We're just zooming in a lot more. Um, so um, Susie's using satellites and drones, and we're just putting our sensor right in the manure. <laughs> so here's a, a little stand here that was developed uh, by a German company, Flegel, um, which I think is quite innovative. Um, you'll see a lot of these sensors integrated on, on the manure spreader. Um, but in this case, they're actually moving the manure from, um, from a storage um, location onto a spreader and sensing it as the spreader is loaded. And the near-infrared reflectance technology has been around for a long time, um, but what is really enabling this and what I think can really add value to dairy farmers is that the, the cloud computing and data informatics part of this is huge. So really being able to put that data in a form that can be useful um, to layer that data with other management information. 
And I think that's why we're really seeing this investment by um, Deer and others. Um, and I apologize if I, um, I've been working with them a while. I apologize if I point to them more. Um, in fact, the sensor technology that we use is uh, independent of them for the Deer Innovation Hub project. Um, but really, um, this technology um, has, has been sought out in, in this space and in satellites and in drones because it has a lot of sensitivity, especially the things that are organic. So anything that's got a hydrogen bond, so we're seeing OHs, NHs. And what we're doing is we're, we're, we have a, a small um, diagram down here. We're letting the light interact with the manure as it flows through, um, through the system. And as that light interacts with the manure particles, it's scattered and reflected. And we have a, a rule of thumb or a law um, that says, we're gonna assume that light that doesn't come back into our sensor was light that was absorbed by some chemical species. And then we mine that data to try to predict those chemical species. And as this pr presentation progresses, I, I really want you to hold on to the idea, idea that we're really, um, we're really looking at kind of a, a secondary um, measurement here. We're not measuring things directly, right? We're inferring from data um, what, the, um, what the nutrient composition is. And that process is complex. And because NIR is sensitive to a lot of things, it means that it also can be um, confused by a lot of things, let's say. Next slide. So we don't have a lot of independent data here in the US about um, these systems. Um, one thing we can look to is the, the German Agricultural Society, and I'm not going to try to pronounce the, the German version of that, <laughs> but um, there's a farmer organization in Germany. One of the big things they do is organize Agrotechnica, and, which is the world's largest farm show. But the other thing that they do is they independently evaluate equipment. And they developed a, basically a test method whereby they place a sensor onto a manure spreader and are able to take samples. And what they, they do is they look at the sensor's um, utility, not only for predicting um, the dry matter content of them and or the solids content, but they look at all the chemical species. And then they certify which species pass the threshold. And one of the big challenges that we see um, in developing a, a proximate sensor technology in manure is just the inherent variability of manure itself and the reference methods for um, understanding um, the nutrient content of manures. Next slide, please. All right. Um, so that's really where we focused uh, our Dairy Innovation Hub work. Um, Dr. Sanford, um, we collected manure samples in bulk. Um, we mixed them thoroughly, and then we subsampled them and sent them out to um, eight different laboratories. And then we did basically an internal test to see um, you know, how well are the labs agreeing with one another. And you know, one of the challenges, there's a couple of challenges that we wanted to get at first. One is how much does manure vary? Because one thing we know about building a prediction model, and um, you'll see that in Susie's plot too, like if you don't get a, lot, a wide enough standard deviation in the data you're looking at, you don't get a good fit no matter how, <laughs> no matter what you try. Um, so one thing we want to do is we want to predict things that vary. Um, so that, that checks out pretty well in manure quite across many chemical species. But we also want a reference method that we can agree with. And the, the initial work that we show here, so we did a, a test with, um, and these labs were certified um, by MAP. Um, so this is the Manure Analysis Proficiency Program. And so there are some internal checks that these labs are already doing. So we chose these labs as they were MAP labs. And we found out that, you know, they really did, did a good job on total solids and nitrogen. Um, we had really um, variable right, uh, results in ammonia. And um, we really had a lot of differences in phosphorus and potassium. In this paper, if, if anyone's interested in looking at the details, they can reach out to me. It's open access and available um, right now. Next slide, please. So, you know, when we, um, when we dig into that data and think about those types of things, you know, what, what are the practical considerations for um, thinking about adopting a technology such as this? <clears throat> One of the first things is the regulatory um, framework across the United States is um, 
maybe haphazard is a way to say it, <laughs> each state. Uh, so we have the EPA who sets some, re some baseline regulatory um, standards, but each state has the ability um, to change that. And so it really will move slowly. So being able to rely on something like NIRS to predict manure composition and to use that um, for your nutrient management plan, um, that's gonna take some time. That's gonna take some um, building confidence in the technology, which is one of our objectives, but it is also gonna take uh, state legislation in, in a lot of cases, unfortunately. Um, so that's one thing to think about. You'll probably still need to continue to collect the samples that you're collecting now for regulatory compliance. I guess, luckily, you don't have to collect that many samples for like regulatory compliance, um, but that is one of the advantages of a technology such as this. The next thing is really to consider how your data will be transferred and managed. Um, of course, um, some of these companies, their big selling point is that they have a, built a cloud ecosystem that all the data is layered, and that's you know a consideration that you might um, think about. Next slide, please. Then I would um, ask for certification of performance. Um, so these are some of the, this is what the DLG badges look like um, for certification. And you'll notice that not only are the um, sensors um, certified for the, manure, the type of manure, like cattle manure or hog manure, um, or you know, even digestate coming out of like um, an aromic digestion system, um, but they're also certified by uh, chemical species. So you'll see like that first one there, that deer had a certification for dry matter, total nitrogen, ammonia, phosphorus, and potassium. So they, they checked a lot of the boxes, but you'll see the one on the end, a Dynamica generale, they were only certified in hog manure um, for one chemical species, and sorry, it's in German, so <laughs> I can guess what it is, but I don't wanna make a fool of myself. Um, <laughs> so the other thing to consider is that these instruments work well in higher solids type manure, and that's one of the big challenges we saw working on this project. So these, these technologies really got their start in Europe. And when they came to America, we had a lot of manure that was low solids because we have a lot of manure processing. We're maybe mixing other waste streams with the manure on the farm. And so you really wanna be working with manure that is over 2% solids. And every company that does this will give you a range and it's usually like two to 10, two to 12%. Next slide, please. Okay. So just kind of a loop back, you know, from the practical and what's happening today to what we're working on to help um, improve this technology and help improve our understanding of it is um, we're really trying to understand, is it useful for, for managing nutrient vari variability? And we have a, a plot study that was funded by the Dairy Innovation Hub where we're gonna look at um, using a fixed rate, variable rate manure on different plots of land with different soil sampling and management zones to see if we can really drive changes um, and we have one year funded through the Dairy Hub, but we've asked for an additional three years of funding um, from the Fertilizer Council. So we, we hope to have kind of a long-term study to really understand uh, the return on this type of technology. Next slide, please. And with that, I really would like to thank, um, of course, the Dairy Innovation Hub who drove this project. I'd like, I'd like to thank John Deere who has um, supported our work throughout this time and who is, um, been a good collaborator on this project and um, honestly very professional and open to good and bad news about this technology. Uh, they really want this to work for their customers too. And then we actually work with an independent NIRS sensor for our work, uh, Polytech, and they've helped support us with technical expertise and equipment. And with that, I would like to turn it over to um, Joseph Wu and John Oberdalen. Thank you, Matt. Hi everyone, my name is Joseph Wu and I'm an Associate Professor in Chemistry. And joining with me is uh, my colleague, John Opliodun, Professor in Mechanical Engineering. We are at UW Platteville. Thank you for this opportunity to present our research work today. Our presentation title is Development of Milk Protein-Based 3D Printing Biocomposites. Our story began four years ago when we look at ways to use renewable material in the application of 3D printing. Just as a quick background, uh, if you're not aware of that, uh, 3D printing is a new way of making an object with specific shape and size precisely controlled by the computer. So on the right in this slide, you can see a spool of black filament 
and a three, 3D, uh, two 3D printed parts produced from our past research. Those are made out of lignin, which is one important ingredient in the plant material, and a biodegradable polymer. So basically, all these parts can be biodegraded in the nature if they throw into uh, the environment. So it's very clean compared to the petroleum-based polymer. This offer a lot of advantage. So using the same mindset, we are looking at milk proteins as a material rather than food. So our research quest is to see if we can make use of the milk protein in 3D printing and share with you our current uh, research updates. The reason we choose the photograph here with a shelf of milk and a shelf of filament, we envision with our uh, progress in research, hopefully we able to uh, convert into a new commercial material. Next slide, please. We are developing ways to reuse the milk because we have heard about milk being thrown away due to either expiration, storage, waste from the dairy processing, or even overproduction. In 2016 alone, millions of gallons of milk were thrown away due to overproduction. And it sadly, it happened again last year due to the pandemic. It saddened us when we heard about this news because we imagined that farmer will lose their revenue. And second, secondly, the thrown milk to the environment can uh, pose potential negative impact in our environment. So, um, so we propose a way to reuse those milk proteins so that we can address these two challenges facing in this community. Next slide, please. The milk protein can be perceived as a polymer from chemistry point of view, but working with it is proven pretty challenging. Um, me and my student working over the summer try to turn this into a thermal plastic. We see a lot of challenges, but we also see some promising aspects. On the, on the left, it shows two chemical structure. The top one represents the protein, and the bottom one uh, represents this well-known polymer called nylon 66. If you look at those structures carefully enough, you will see some similarities. And that also make us believe that protein-based polymer could be a potential. We have attempted many formulation, which is shown on the right, uh, many different polymer we generate over the summer. And we use a uh, protein such as caseins and whey. Uh, these two protein are different. Um, so we attempt to, uh, to study them and we learn that uh, the pro milk protein can actually make a very strong polymer material. But one thing we also notice is that uh, the polymer by itself, if it's just uh, made from pure casein or pure whey, they are very brittle and they might have an issue if we want to develop into a product. So we try um, uh, many different ways and I'm going to turn over to John and he will tell you more about 3D printing with this uh, milk protein. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, from the materials manufacturing and engineering standpoint, uh, as Joseph has said, we have this primary ob objective to convert the, the proteins, casein and whey, into useful raw materials that can be used to 3D print uh, useful objects that can be used in the society, either for engineering applications or for some other applications. You will see in this slide, uh, on the right cycle here, we have filament at the top, we have uh, powder at the, lower, at the lower right, and we have a bottle on the left. 
we are trying to look at three different approaches for using materials that are formulated from casing and whey to make 3D, 3D printing raw materials. The top uh, material, which is the filament we are seeing, represents the common 3D printing that is very, uh, that most people are familiar with in the society. They are uh, filaments, and those ones are based on extrusion uh, process to make 3D objects. Then we also have some 3D printing processes that are based on powder alone, many converting uh, powder form of material directly to, to solid using lasers. Then we, the one on the left represents uh, liquid formulations, uh, liquids that are photo curable. They have photo initiators inside them so that when they are illuminated by the right ultraviolet light, they turn into solid objects that can be used. So we are looking at them at the, at the approach, approaches, many of these three methods for converting casing and whey to useful objects uh, using these diverse approaches. And at the start of, the, of this work, we want to start with what we're already familiar with, the one that uses uh, filament. And as Joseph mentioned, we have a kind of a background experience for the past three, four years. We have been working on extraction of lignin, lignin that are found in grasses and in trees and about compatible uh, 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 and environmentally sus sustainable uh, for making uh, filaments for uh, fabricating engineering materials. And the material is already being patented and where is it that rich background experience to make our formulation of this of the casing and way to make the the material formulations that are useful for converting uh, materials to uh, useful objects through 3d printing so on the left hand side you see a circle here uh, that shows the three different methods the one at the top shows uh, the common 3d printers that, are, that uses filaments the one that the lower left in the same cycle shows the one that uses laser for converting uh, powder materials to 3D solids. And the one on the lower left shows the a kind of a description of the machine that is used for converting photo curable liquid resins into solid materials. Next slide, please. So the two approaches that I said we are, we are working on are the extrusion-based method and the photo based method. So we start. I will start my explanation on this with the extrusion-based method. Uh, the method involves uh, compounding or formulating the raw material. And in this case, our raw material, the base material we're using is PLA, polylactic acid, which is a very common material now. We're using it as a benchmark or as a uh, matrix into which the whey and casing are filled and blended together thoroughly and extruded into filaments. And we have done initial trial in extruding the material into filaments and we pelletize it and we re-extrude again. That to us is a good success so far in the process because it is not every material that extrudes successfully. We have tried different materials in the past that were not successful. And this one gives us an interesting uh, 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 interesting result at the beginning of the process. So what we're going to do going forward from here is to use the filaments to fabricate uh, samples that could be used to test the mechanical properties and the thermal properties of the objects that will be made using the raw material and to also enable us to know what other things we can do to improve or to increase the weight fractions of the proteins in the PLA because our objective is to have a maximum use of the proteins in the PLA for, the, for, for making the raw materials and for 3D printing 
and that way we can have more usefulness of those uh, materials and benefit farmers. Next slide, please. So the second approach that uses uh, VAT photopolymerization process, and this method, as I mentioned a while ago, uses uh, photocurable liquid resins. So we've made the formulation uh, using casein for now. We are going to work on uh, whey and also a mixture of whey and casein in our in our plants. And we mix it with the photocurable liquid. And at the, at the start, we started with 5%. Uh, when you are doing something, you, we usually start small, then increase it uh, gradually based on the results that we are getting. So we tried 5% and 10% for now, and they both printed well. They printed very well uh, to our excitement. And uh, we have begun the process of testing the, the some of the uh, samples that were that were printed using the the process. Next slide, please. So this slide shows us some of the early results that we have had from the printed samples. Uh, the top left shows us the tensile strengths. The tensile strengths uh, represents how strong the materials are. And we have a kind of a comparative study here. The two bars on the left side of the, of the graph I'm referring to uh, are for the control materials. The base photocurable liquid material alone without addition of the proteins. And the middle one represents the one with 5%. And the, the ones on the right, the two on the right, shows the ones uh, in which we have 10% of the uh, protein materials inside. We could see that there's not much of difference in the strength values that were recorded in all of them. There's a, although there's a marginal decrease, which sometimes is expected uh, in biological materials. And what we do, what we are studying currently is to see how we can improve this on these strength values and probably exceed uh, the values that we have for the control materials. Then on the top right hand corner, we are able to see uh, results from modulus of elasticity. This represents the resistance of materials to stretching. Imagine if you hold a rubber material in your hand, it's easily stretchable. But if you hold metal or wood in your hand, you cannot use your hand to stretch any of them. So the modulus of elasticity is higher if the material has higher resistance to stretching. So we could see that on the control materials, which is the two bars on the left of that graph, we have less modulus of elasticity compared to the middle material, which is which has 5% of the protein material. And the one on the immediate right of the center also have higher than the control materials. And those were cured using the same parameters uh, at 30 minutes after fabrication. And in fact, all of them go through the curing process. And what we found out initially now is that we shouldn't cure it more than necessary. The one on the rightmost uh, uh, part of the graph shows the one that was, was cured for one hour. It tells us at this early start of the results that we shouldn't go beyond 30 minutes. Then the percentage elongation indicates how much the material stretches. And we could see some vari variations between the the control material, which is on the lower graph now, and the one that has the casein or the protein materials. And we, these are exciting results for us, and we are very optimistic based on our experience in bar materials formulations for 3D printing, that these are indicative of good success to come as we proceed in the experimentation and research. Next, please. So we would like to thank the the Dairy Hub, the funders of this project, it is an exciting one for us to be involved in sustainable uh, material development for use in our uh, in different areas and to also help farmers to have new channels of income for the product. Thank you.
All right, thank you to Joseph and John, and uh, thank you also to Susie and Matt, who you heard from earlier. Now that you've heard a little bit about each project, we have about uh, a little less than 10 minutes, about 10 minutes for, uh, for questions. And again, to remind everybody, you can type your questions right into the uh, conference platform. Um, we already have a couple waiting. So um, I'll just kind of go through the questions and pose them to uh, the folks that they apply to. So um, this question actually is for Joseph and John. Um, do you think your research can add value to milk as opposed to just using waste milk? Well, if I may ask, the research will help to uh, identify a, a new channel for revenue for milk production. Milk production currently is principally for consumption, for food, and we are looking at another way to use the same product that could bring some economic benefit to dairy farmers. And we identify that this milk has proteins that have properties like uh, polymers that will be helpful from our presentation. And that in itself is adding value to make Some milk could, could be made uh, directly for this purpose. Uh, we hear of overproduction or reduction in supply. So if there's reduction in supply among the populace, the, the supply could be channeled to other uh, areas uh, rather than uh, having a situation which is under so uh, uh, reduced reductions in uh, demand will now have probably the same demand that is already channeled and um, part of it will be channeled to people that will need it for for processing for engineering applications um i guess as a layup to that question um you know there's increasing interest in kind of weaning off of few fossil fuels for things like plastics. Um, and there are, you know, there are methods to use milk to make plastics, um, but they're considerably more expensive. Um, do you see any of that in the work that you're doing? Um, would, would filament derived from, from milk products be competitively priced or what are you seeing in that space? Yeah, we see a uniqueness in uh, the use of uh, biological materials for engineering applications. And even all over the world now, people are turning around to sustainable materials uh, from, fossil, from fossils because of the environmental impact of fossils. And uh, we have a formulation that is unique and the price that we are going to have or the cost of production is part of the things that we are considering. We want to make sure that our products are competitive with the uh, synthetic or petroleum based or derived products, competitive in terms of performance and also competitive in terms of, of the cost of the materials. And we are increasingly seeing companies that are interested. Uh, we had a, a meeting with a company, B, BSF, not long ago about some of our products that we are developing and patenting. And what they tell us is that they are more interested in sustainable materials now that could have comparable co performance with petroleum developed derived materials. So we are very hopeful that MIC, as we are working on it now, will result in competitive products, engineering products, that will be comparable in every way to uh, uh, petroleum derived uh, materials, both in cost and in performance. Great, thanks. Um, our, our next question, well, this, this actually is a question um, for all of you. Um, how important is uh, the funding that you're getting from the Dairy Hub um, to completing the work that you're involved with? You can jump, any of you can jump in. Uh, 
I mean, for me, extremely important. My heart is really in um, the ecology of ecosystems. And I um, got into agriculture just starting two years ago, basically. I was in forestry before. So I'm really interested in, um, in how agriculture can really help um, improve the sustainability of our ecosystems. And I think it's possible. And uh, with an added benefit that we could also help increase some profits uh, for farmers. So for me, this is really important. <laughs> so thank you for funding. <laughs> yeah, for us, um, we just wouldn't be doing the work we're doing um, without funding um, from the Dairy Innovation Hub stakeholders. Um, <clears throat> certainly we um, have you know, been working on this technology as I mentioned, but we're really able to switch and look at it from a different perspective, from an end user perspective, from a return on investment perspective. And I think that's really important. And it's been it's been fun to um, interrogate the the work that we've been doing over the past three years in that in that way. So for us, uh, we we also thank for the funding. Without this funding, we won't be able to investigate uh, producing this uh, 3D printing material and try to figure out a new way of revenue for for uh, dairy farmers. So we appreciate that. Great. Thank you. Um, some of you touched on this a little bit, but um, a question that we got was, um, how easy do you guys think it's going to be to translate this research into you know tangible profits or difference making for farms well in our own case in our research myself and joseph uh we are working with wises and uh, for the process of uh, protecting the patent rights for the developments that we're making. And WISIS have been, have been very helpful, or they are very helpful in transforming or converting uh, uh, products from research into commercialized products by linking us with industry partners that will be interested in the uh, products that we are developing in the laboratories. So that process has already begun uh, we're working closely with them and we think that that will help in making impact down the road to the farmers once we have uh, interested parties that will be, will be willing to commercialize the product so it's, it's something we, are, we have already started considering from our own side I guess um, from my perspective, um, there's already a bunch of um, uh, organizations that are looking into um, carbon credits, like the company Indigo Ag. I would like to see it on the federal level too, like in other countries like Canada. But um, I think in the future, this will be an opportunity for farmers to increase their profits um, through those markets. I had the, the fortunate job of collecting manure samples and meeting with the manure haulers. And um, <clears throat> I, um, as enjoyable as that was, <laughs> I did get a neat perspective of uh, from them. And, and a lot of times when we had uh, NIR sensing on the forage harvester, they're like, what is the return for someone who runs a custom operation on this new technology? I can provide new data, but how does it help the producer? I didn't mention I was there to collect a manure sample and give them a free hat. And uh, I didn't ask about this, but the, this technology, the uptake is really high because documentation is so important in nutrient management and planning. And the public scrutiny is very high on manure. And so custom operators and manure haulers are really good at their jobs. And they really want to be able to prove that they did the right thing, that they followed the setbacks they applied when they were supposed to in the right amount, the right place, the right time. So. Um, it's actually pretty exciting to not be the enemy for once out in the field. Um, they were really uh, embracing us uh, with open arms. Thanks, Matt. Um, and thanks to all of you. We've uh, reached our time limit. 
So I just want to, again, uh, thank our audience for um, hanging out with us this morning and to the conference organizers. It's a, it's a huge lift to put together a virtual conference. And um, we really appreciate the platform that you all have given us today. So as we close, um, you might be asking yourself, okay, well, now what? Um, you know, it's important for farmers and processors and allied industry, you know, even everyday citizens to engage with the hub. And we strive to maintain open and transparent communication about our efforts funded by the state of Wisconsin. So um, to stay up to date on our efforts, you can go to our website um, and you can subscribe to get our newsletter, all of our other materials, join our mailing list, etc. So we hope that you're going to do that. Um, thank you again, and have a great rest of your conference experience. So thank you.